Welcome to another episode of Fill in the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Corey. Yo. So, Corey, do you know what we're talking about today? I did not. We are actually talking about the Megatherium. All right. Well, it was a type of... The what? The Megatherium. Is that... Okay. Is that theorem or theorem? I think it's pronounced reum, to be honest with you. It's spelled reum, but it's actually, like, pronounced Megatherium. All right. So, uh, and I actually wrote that out, syllabled it out to make sure I was getting the correct pronunciation on it. I gotcha. But it was from the Greek mega, meaning great, and therian, meaning beast. It was a genius elephant-sized ground sloth, endemic to South America. Sometimes called the giant ground sloth that lived from the early uh. Pleistocene. Though the end of the Pleistocene, only a few other land mammals equaled or exceeded Megatherium in the size such as large as Probistians and the giant rhinoceros. So, what do you know about the Pleistocene? Nothing. Basically, it was the last glacial period. Okay. So, like mammoths, all that. This is where this last thing was really known to be around. You don't see giant ground sloths. Imagine that, dude. Though, it'd be dude. so awesome to have giant ground sloths. Dude, I'm telling you, I want a sloth. So, you know that already. I'm already into this topic. But the whole idea of a giant sloth, do you think they'd be slow or like grizzly bear sized? Or do you think bigger than that? Well, did, we don't know how big they are. Did they say the measurements yet? Not yet. That's later to be told. But from your just general knowledge or general thinking or kind oh. of anticipation of what it's going to be, what do you picture when I say giant ground sloth? Well, giant, I'd have high hopes, I think. And I'd want it to be like freaking. We're not talking size. ho 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 green giant. We're talking well, T yeah, Rex size yeah, monster. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to see that. Something but you if see it's in not Jurassic that Park. big, I I could totally see it being double the size of a bear. Dude, Easy. could you picture someone walking down the street with like a giant ground sloth on a leash, and just picking them up and carrying them? Would they be slow or they quick? What do you mean? You think since they're bigger, but they're a sloth, though. So yeah, you think like, a sloth their is gait? slow. <laughs> what's their gait? You know, if they're, like, really slow, but it's, like, you know, it's like Godzilla. It's, like, one footstep is, like, a whole, you know, it's, like, half a city. Have you seen Futurama where they have the giant ground sloths, and they went to go battle the people, and the giant sloths were moving, like, really slow, and the guy was, like, ah, as the hand was slowly, and then, like, they come back in 30 minutes later into the episode, and it's still, like, barely getting to him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just still screaming. So let's talk about the taxonomy behind this creature. The first fossil specimen of the Megatherium was discovered in 1788 by Manuel Torres on the bank of the Lujan River in Argentina. Based on Bruce's illustrations, comparative anatomist Georges Curvier determined the relationships and appearance of the Megatherium. He published his first paper on the subject in 1796, a transcript of a previous lecture at the French Academy of Sciences. He published on the subject again in 1804. This paper was republished in his book, Resurgis sur les Assessums Fossilis de Quantorpulis in his 1796 paper. Try saying that three times fast. Curvier assigned the fossil the scientific name Megatherium Americanum. Curvier determined that Megatherium was a sloth and at first believed that it was used large claws for climbing trees, like modern sloths, although he later changed his hypothesis to support a subterranean lifestyle with the claws used to dig tunnels. Wow. So instead of tunnels, so in using these giant, this giant ground sloth, imagine a giant sloth that dug tunnels underground like the size of a train hole. Like we're talking Elon Musk is building tunnels for imagine cars. Imagine hearing that like under your, like your whole house would shake from like that movement, that seismic movement. I, well, it's, I guess it's not seismic, is it? It depends. Right. Is this thing burrowing under your house and next thing you know your whole house collapsed because no, it's a right. sinkhole? Um, but just like, yeah, the ground shaking from it, from the displacement, I mean, that'd be crazy. Well, fossils of Megatherium and other Western megafauna proved popular with the Georgian era public until the discovery of the dinosaur some decades later. Since the original discovery, numerous other fossil Megatherium skeletons have been discovered across South America. In Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Guyana, Paraguay, Peru, and Uruguay. New species in the genus Megatherium have been described in 2004 and 2006, respectively. So the evolution of the ground sloth. Ground sloths belong to a superorder of 
Exonartha, a group of South American origin which also includes extinct Pampertheras and Glyphodonts, as well as living tree sloths, armadillos, and anteaters. The subgenus and species Megatherium, um, also known as the Pseudomegatherium, Targenus appears to be a junior synonym of M. American Thumb, and a merely a small individual. The ground sloths, as well with other exenotherans, involved in isolation in South America, while it is an island continent during the Paleogene era. So during the Pleistocene, the Central American Isthmus formed, causing the Great American Interchange and a mass extinct extinction of much of the indi indigenous South um, American megafauna. Ground sloths were largely unaffected and continued to thrive in spite of competition from the northern immigrants. Ground sloths were among the various South American animal groups to migrate northwards into North America, where they remained and flourished until the late Pleistocene. So we talk about these cavemen or these tribes that hunt down mammoths and killed, you know, killed off all the woolly mammoths and whatever didn't get killed by them, got killed by the glacial freeze and all that mm -hmm. stuff that happened. Well, the last major glacial period that we had that ended because it was like, what was it? It was a supreme melting or something where all the ice melted and then these animals just died um, and got hunted down and things of that sort. The ground sloths actually had to move. So imagine hunting a ground sloth, this giant being, much like you're already worried about woolly mammoths and killing them with spears and how it takes groups to take down one of those things. And we see movies like BC or some 10,000 BC where it's like those tribal hunters killing woolly mammoths and stuff. You got to kill a ground sloth, this animal that just digs in the ground and also kind of it's like a bear, like it's bigger than a bear, but it moves like a bear. Like when a bear runs and it's on four legs, imagine that, but a ground sloth and able to dig underground. That's a ferocious predator. Imagine trying to hunt one of those down. Imagine killing that and putting it in your house like the Flintstones. Having that on your rug instead of a dinosaur. Honestly, this sounds cooler than dinosaurs to me. So, the rhinoceros-sized promegatherium pro of the Miocene is suggested as the ancestor of the megatherium. The oldest and smallest species of megatherium is M. altipilisium of the Pileocene Bolivia. It was very similar to promegatherium and was about the size of a rhinoceros. So, these thing, this thing that came before the giant ground sloth which is like its predecessor, was the size of a rhinoceros and has been regarded as a medium-sized megatherium species. Can you imagine seeing that thing hanging on a massive tree that could actually support it? And you wouldn't, let's say you didn't, like you're going through like rainforest, right? And you're just walking. And there's just the, a rhino in no, the tree? No, you don't even hardly see it, right? And don't think about a rhino, think about a sloth. I'm like trying the, to think of the tree size. that could support that giant ground right. sloth. That's I think I'm that's saying. why they Rain dig forest. tunnels and they don't well, climb on. trees. I'm just saying. Well, I know, I know. I'm just hang. On. So, like, just imagine seeing something that big, like, or not even noticing it right away, and just it slightly just moves, goes, whoa, you know, like, and it, like, it's just so massive to see something so big in a tree like that. What would you do? What would you do? All I'm thinking is a really good cartoon right now where it's just a giant sloth trying to like jump to the next tree and all you hear is you're just walking. It's like two people walking in a forest. Like, listen, two people walking in a trail, okay? okay. It's like a cartoon animated series. Mm. Two people walking in a trail. All you hear is in the background, like all you hear is a bunch of tree branches breaking. Then all you hear is this giant ground sloth go, shit, and then just <laughs> fly and hit the ground. Like, <laughs> But that would make such a large thud. Like, you know, if it's we're talking about the size of a rhinoceros. Just landing right beside you, boom. That's like where the wild things are. Ooh. You know what I mean? It sends you on an adventure. Yeah. A little bit. You can kind of take that. I wish we had these kind of things. I mean, we have like models and like, like you know, reanimated or not reanimated, but, you know, people taxidermied up like, you know, yeah. a fake image of one. But that's only from our, what we know from what we gathered through evidence of what these things might have looked like. We don't truly know what they actually look like. Maybe somebody will do a robotics project for a museum or I something. I think we'd have to go back in time. So... It, so, the species of Megatherium became larger over time, with the largest species of M. Americanum of the late Pleistocene reaching the size of an African elephant. 
So the last kind of descendants Those of these ground huge. sloths are the size of African elephants. So imagine that in a tree. A massive tree. And what would you do if you saw something pop around that looked like a sloth? Was that but was that big? Would you freak I mean you'd have to freak out because the noise it would make just moving. <laughs> So they had one that was the size of a rhino, which was supposed to be like the smallest. And then they had another one that was a little bit bigger than a rhinosaur, but smaller than an elephant. So it's slowly increasing. And then the last species that's known, which is at the, like the last part of the glacial freeze era, was the size of an African elephant. So where we see humans get bigger and bigger and bigger, these sloths are doing the same exact thing. So Megatherium is actually one of the largest land mammals known to have existed weighing up to four tons and measuring up to basically 20 feet in length from head to tail. It was the largest known ground sloth as big as modern elephants and would have only exceeded in its time by a few species of mammoth. The group is known primarily from its largest species M. americanum. Megatherium species were members of the abundant Pleistocene megafauna, large mammals that lived during the Pleistocene epoch. I mean, seriously. Yeah, that thing looks like a monster. For people that don't know, we're looking up pictures of this thing right now, and this thing is literally grabbing tree branches and bringing it down <laughs> to eat the leaves. Like, like a giraffe. the tops of the tree. Okay, so a giraffe has a neck to adjust to get itself to get the, the leaves that were up tall. And we might think that might be evolution because they might have gotten bigger over time. These things are literally strong enough to get on their hind legs and grab a tree branch and bring it down to eat the food and off bring the Bring down top the tree, yeah. That's nuts. Yeah, but it's, yes, that, something that big? Jeez Louise. I think of a normal sloth being huge. This thing looks more like a mix of a sloth and a bear, though. Right. So it has a robust skeleton with a large pelvic girdle and a broad muscular tail. It is large in size enabled it to feed at heights unreachable by other contemporary herbivores. Thank God it's a herbivore. Rising on its powerful hind legs and using its tail to form a tripod, Megatherium could support its massive body weight while using the curved claws on its long forelegs to pull down branches with the choicest leaves. This sloth, like a modern anteater, walked on its sides of its feet because its claws prevented it from being put them on flat ground. Although it was primarily a quadruped, its trackways show that it was capable of bipedal locomotion. Bipedal mechanics analysis also suggests it had adaptions to bipedalism. Do you know what bipedalism is? Yes. What is bipedalism? Uh, walking on two feet. Yep, it is the measurement of an organism and the use of its hind legs. So Megatherium had a narrow, cone-shaped mouth and prehensible lips that were probably used to select particular plants and fruits. While some evidence suggests this animal could use its tongue to differentiate and select its foliage, the lips probably had a more important role in things like this. Like other sloths, Megatherium lacked the enamel deciduous dentition and dental cusp patterns of other mammals. Instead of enamel, the tooth displays a layer of cementium, orthodentine, and modified orthodentine, creating a soft, easily abraded surface. Yeah, you're showing me the size of it right I now. Just mean so scary. where we have the common sloth and the average person is probably, you know, six foot, let's say. Uh, and then the, the sloth about to be up from our chest, probably to our top of our head. And then these things were like six Two of us stacked, of us. Yeah, stacked on top of each other. Yeah. Where an elephant's wider, if this thing was on its hind legs, it'd be about like the, the, an elephant. It's taller than an elephant standing up on its hind yeah, legs. Totally. So if it was on all fours, it would be literally the size of an elephant. Thank God they're herbivores, man. Right. If they were... Can't, like carnivores, imagine where we would be at today. Right, so after you after you find out these things might... Okay, let's just say these things are friendly, right? Or at least mellow. Let's hope. Or at least mellow enough to be friendly, right? They just, let's say they move slow, they're mellow, just like the sloths we know now, but they're just bigger. People would love that, right? It'd be so interesting. Once you know that, then the next time you see this massive, like, huge thing in the tree that you should naturally be afraid of, at least from your evolutionary conditioning like now you'd be like hey buddy you know like Dude, just... <laughs> imagine if we hooked a saddle to it and watched it like climb a tree or dug in tunnels and that was our sense of travel back then like 
I could see that. Because people used to ride mammoths. It's hard to think you couldn't want want to even have that aspiration to try and ride one of these things. I would be the first person that would try and loop a saddle onto that thing. Like, dig me a tunnel. Seriously. They were the original subway trains. That's just, it just, it, it, that boggles my mind. Well, the teeth are spaced equidensely in a series located posteriorly in the mouth, which leaves space at the prudentiary. There is no dis, disestima through the length of its teeth row and the predatory spout can be varied by species. Analysis of wear and the biomechanics of the massasauri tooth row and of the predatory spout muscles suggest that they chewed vertically. Megatherias display deeper jaws than other sloth clades. Some of the elements in the oral cavity of the megatherium were fused together, originally articulated stoffal and epiphial, and the other apparatuses lies farther anteriorly which together with the elongated, steeply inclined mandibular sympasis indicates a relatively shorter genohede muscle and thus more limited capacity for tongue protrusion. So the idea of this thing for people that don't know any of those large words like me that I just said, basically its tongue wouldn't fit in its mouth. So think of Gene Simmons where he has that long tongue where he can't kind of keep it in his mouth a little bit, and he's always kind of flashing it on stage, this thing always kind of looked like it was giving you, like sticking its tongue out at you, because its tongue was so long, it just couldn't fit in its mouth for the way its snout was shaped. So like it had like a horse... I did see some pictures that had like a long tongue. It had like a horse's snout, but its tongue was so long, it would stick out like a foot, so the thing had a troubled time keeping its tongue in its mouth. So it was well adapted for strong, predominantly orthal, up-down movement for eating rough vegetation. Megatherium possessed the narrowest muzzle of all ground sloths from the Pleistocene. This leads paleobiologists to believe that it was a very selective eater. It had the ability to pick and choose which leaves and twigs it would consume. Megatherium had a large, narrow, prehensible lip that was capable of grabbing and tearing off particular leaves and twigs and other sorts of vegetation. Let's talk about this thing's habitat. Megatherium inhabited woodland and grassland environments of the lightly wooded areas of South America, where it was an endemic species as recently as 10,000 years ago. Megatherium was adapted to temperate a rid of semi-rid open habitats. An example of those most recent finds is at the Cuva de Milidon in Patagonian Chile. The closely related genius Eromorithium that had been classified occasionally as part of the Megatherium lived in more tropical environments further north and invaded temperate North America as part of the Great American Interchange. Do you know what the Great American Interchange is? Can you look that up for me? It's a good thing you have a computer on there. You're like my Jamie from Joe Rogan. I just asked you to pull a bunch of stuff up. So why you look up the Great American Interchange? Was an important late Cenozoic Paleozoogeographic event in which land and freshwater fauna migrated from North America via Central America to South America and vice versa as the volcanic isthmus of Panama rose up from the seafloor and bridged the formerly separated continents. So the whole idea that the earth changing formed all these animals to migrate to different areas. Is that what I'm pulling from that? Yes. Ooh, look at that. Robbie has a good interpretation of Wikipedia's knowledge. Thank you. The giant ground sloth lived mostly in groups, but it may uh, have lived singly in caves. It probably had mainly a browsing diet in open habitats, but also it probably fed on other moderate to soft tough food. For millions of years, the sloth did not have many enemies to bother it, so it was probably a diurnal animal. The giant ground sloth was a herbivore feeding on leaves such as eucaeus, agaves, and grasses. While it fed chiefly on terrestrial plants, it could also stand on its hind legs using its tail as a balancing tripod and reach for upper growth vegetation. It would pull itself upright to sit on its haunches or to stand and then tug at the plants with its feet, digging them up with five sharp claws on each foot. So the idea... It looked big too. Well, idea that these things would sit back and if there was a plant in front of it, it would dig it up with its feet and then eat it. 
So using its feet as shovels and then using its hands to grab branches and pull it down and so it could eat it with its mouth. This is a smart animal mm -hmm. for something living back then where we think of T-Rex like just going around killing anything it sees or trying to eat anything it sees and not really have a, having a big brain. We knew I mean, like that they had like... Digit dexterity. Yeah, and they had like... We knew they had like a pea-sized brain for their giant body. But these mammals are huge and they have a, a sophisticated brain it seems like. So as they would dig up these plants with their feet, the sloth used its simple teeth to grind down food before swallowing it, and its highly developed cheek muscles helped in this process. The sloth's stomach was able to digest coarse and fibrocious food. It is likely that it spent a lot of time resting to aid its digestion. So we say sloths sleep all the time because their digestive systems are so slow. Maybe that's what they link to this common ancestor, that they have to sleep after... They eat a meal to aid in digestion because they're eating such strong, hard digesting foods like vegetables. We know that to be a long digesting, filling food. And these things are living off that. What do you know about the digestion of sloths of today? They're definitely slow considering that they only eat two times every week and a half. And it's a small thing, like something that would fit in your hand. Like, you know, where you feed your goldfish just a handful of food and then wait a couple of days and feed it again a handful of food. Or you're the type that feeds it every day. But you only need to feed it like a little sprinkle and they, they, they eat it up and it seems like they're full for the rest of the day. That's like with a sloth. If I owned, I actually looked this up when I was going to buy a sloth. They're $5,000 on a website. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's legal, I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, um, th their digestive system is so slow. And also, they only are only up like three days out of the week. But they don't sleep once they're up. Like, once they're up, they're up, like, a full three days, and then they go to sleep for a while. But the weirdest thing is, the hardest part about a sloth is keeping it clean. Because they move so slow that they actually grow fungus on their back. They start to grow, like, basically fungi and stuff. That's what's very common. They use it to blend in their environments when they're in, out in the wild. What blends them into tree growth is that they get this green moss and stuff on their fur. And that's because they literally move so slow that bacteria just starts growing on them. Like, if you didn't move out of bed, like a 400-pound person doesn't move out of bed for a couple days, you start to grow literally mold and stuff inside of your, like, on your skin. Isn't that crazy insane? Because that was one of the complications I looked up of owning a sloth. A lot of people said you have to give it like baths like every couple of days because they'll start to grow moss on their back. It helps them to blend in. When you see pictures of sloths online or something, they have a little yeah, bit of green, green coat to yeah. their skin. And that's because it helps them blend into their surroundings. Have you ever seen an eagle eat a sloth? No, oh, how sad. There's YouTube videos. But this I would sloth, watch that shit. This sloth makes it to this tree and he looks so happy when the vine <laughs> gets to the top and this hawk just flies out of nowhere and just grabs it and just gone. And this thing spreads Dude, eagle out. And it probably got a brutal death too, like getting threat like you, you know what? Getting eaten by a bird would be a brutal one. Because that's a lot of like stabbing, puncturing, ripping. I think the only bird that could pick up a ground sloth would have to be like a pterodactyl or something. Something of the dinosaur age. Oh, can you imagine getting like something that's like about this, like this big, right? Like its beak, right? Can you imagine just kind of getting like that? You know how birds do that, right? Like the they the shake, out. right? That big doing that, meaning like to like your skin and your organs and holy. It's holy. like looking at a picture, a video of vultures. I think yeah, that's the only yeah, yeah, way yeah. back then I think a bird could have killed yeah, a ground like, sloth. You'd get like a group of birds like the crow or the, the some type of scary bird movie where they just started all attacking a ground sloth. So let's talk about a recent morphofunctional analysis that indicates that the M American film was up adapted to wait adapted for strong vertical biting. The teeth are hyposonic and bilophodon and the sagittal section of each loaf is triangular with a sharp edge. This suggests that the teeth were used for cutting rather than grinding, and that hard fibrocious food was not the primary dietary component. While it's been suggested that the ground sloth may have been partially carnivorous, this is its controversial claim. 
Richard Farina, and Ernesto Blanco for the Universidad de la República in Montevideo had, had analyzed a fossil skeleton of the M. americanum and discovered that its olisocranion, the part of the elbow to which the triceps muscle attaches, was very short. This adaption is found in car carnivores and optimizes speed rather than strength. So the theory that this thing actually might have eaten meat as well. I don't see it eating humans, though, from what they've explained with its mouth structure and jaw. Considering that it has a tough time, like its teeth are only shaped to, sh to chew hard, fibrocious foods. And the fact that, like, it's so big, you wouldn't think that it would be able to catch something that wasn't, like, accidentally in a tree, like a bird's nest. See, the hard part about doing a fill-in-the-blank on this type of subject is everything that they're saying is just stuff, evidence that we found through fossils and other types of examinations and then predictions yeah, of, of what they might be. A lot so, of deductions like what's around, what was maybe in its stomach area, like yeah. that sort of stuff. Although I guess if it's fossil, yeah, I think we can still discover stuff like that. Well, so. researchers say this would have enabled M. americanum to use its claws like daggers. They suggest that to add nutrients to its diet, Megatherium may have taken over the kills of Smilodon based on its estimated strength and mechanical advantage of its biceps. It has been proposed that Megatherium could have overturned adult Glyphiotons, which are known as large armored Xenothrans related to armadillos, as a means of scavenging or hunting these animals. However, noting that sloths lack the carnicials typical of predators and that the traces of bones are absent from the many preserved deposits of sloth during so so during they looked through sloth dung okay. and figured that they since there's no anything of like bones or anything that was left behind that they couldn't have been carnivores okay. but they talked about these little armadillo things that were on the ground and what they would do is they would like like you know how like when you see something flip over like a hermit crab and then try and get it out or something or trying to get out like a giant crab or something you're digging into the shell trying to break it yep. that's how these things would break into armadillos that's how that's their theorizing they would just crack into them with their claws but they don't have any true evidence from it since they've never found any type of animal carcass or remains left in their dung so paul martin has described his proposal as fanciful so wait we can get bones but it's easier for us to find shit remnants is it because poop just doesn't decompose? Okay. You think it's already went through the stomach, so it's it's everything it can't digest. So maybe if you just crap on the sidewalk, how long would that crap be there if the weather didn't affect it 100%? Like if it got stuck in mud or something. Because we only have fossils because they were left in tar, right? Isn't that what the whole idea was behind us leaving back fossils or, uh, or dinosaur fossils where they were left in tar or some type of thing that made yeah. it last? I mean... I'm sure there's stuff with that, and obviously we get, like, DNA stuff from, uh, you know, more biological material uh, when it's, like, that, you know, Jurassic Park and Amber stuff, you know, when it comes from, like, I mean, sap. we found, we found but woolly mammoths fully frozen before, Right, so. and that's ice, but there's definitely fossils, yeah, there's definitely fossils in straight rock, so, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it doesn't have to be... I don't think it's always tar. I think I think it's just as long as like specific elements didn't get to it under too harsh of conditions over time, they survived. Did you see in Russia they bought two hundred and fifty thousand acres and they're recreating woolly mammoths and they're opening yeah. it up to a giant like amusement park with woolly mammoths in it? Yeah. It's called the Pleistocene Park or something like that. Isn't that ridiculous? Imagine that. Like they start bringing back saber tooth tigers and all these it's types so awesome. of things, dude. It'd be cool to see, Jurassic but I would park. I would be nervous it would get a little too far like Jurassic Park. Someone would create something ridiculous and the next thing you know it breaks out and starts killing a bunch of people oh. so let's talk about the extinction of this wonderful creature known as the giant ground sloth in the south the giant ground sloth flourished until about 10,500 radiocarbon years bp which is also 8,500 bce most cite the appearance of the expanding population of human hunters as the cause of its extinction there are a few late dates of around 8,000 bp and about one of seven thousand BP for megatherium remains, but the most recent date viewed as credible is about ten thousand BP. The use of bioclimatic envelope modeling indicates that the area of suitable habitat for megatherium had 
had shrunk and become fragmented by the mid Holocene. While this alone would not likely have caused its extinction, it has been cited as a possible contributing factor. So out of all this information that was very, very hard to digest, much like the giant ground sloth trying to eat something, mm -hmm. uh, we have to kind of sit back and think about it for a minute. Like this creature, do you see it as something that would be that is something that we should take the time? Like if I was a scientist, do you think we should try and bring this back? If you were trying to recreate something, would you try and bring it back and re repopulate the earth with giant ground sloths and maybe use them to our advantage? It's hard to think someone couldn't find the time to figure out how to ride one of these things and then train it to either travel for use it like that or be able to hook it up like a horse to a, like a buggy and be able to pull materials with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like large like a large working animal like an ox or something imagine this thing being able to cut down trees throw it in a cart behind its back and then pull this stuff to build homes it'd be pretty amazing it'd be it's skeptical like or if you had people who like traveled with them like gypsy style and they just had all their stuff kind of like on the sides there are already problems with gypsies now you want them riding giant ground sloths yeah. and selling their magic tokens and potions that will cure baldness yeah sure well, anybody wants to take the elixir of madness like we just took into this trying to digest what apparently some being created and put on this earth or something that developed here. I can't really see anything evolving from a fish into a giant ground sloth. But, you know, it's fascinating to think that there's these types of beasts that we only really hear about in stories and stuff and or geological, biographical, whatever books you want to call it. And, uh... It's, it makes me wish that I could go back to a time period like this and maybe experience, you know, what these creatures actually look like in their natural habitat. Well, thanks for listening to this episode of Fill in the Blank, and hopefully we didn't sound too much idiotic on our thoughts on the giant ground sloth. And stay tuned for the next episode.